Hi, welcome to our presentation of the Turbo 9 microprocessor IP. Uh, this is a modern implementation of a classic construction set. My name is Kevin Phillipson. I'm one of the design team members. Uh, my project responsibilities are the microarchitecture design, the RTL development, and the microcode development. Uh, I have 12 years of industry experience in ASIC design. Uh, I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of Florida in 2008 and I'm currently a master's student here at the University of Florida. And my name is Michael Rywalt. I'm also a design team member, and my project responsibilities are the custom microcode macro assembler, uh, C compiler support, and verification of the ISA. I also have 12 years of industry experience in ASIC design, a uh, bachelor's in computer science and software engineering from Florida Tech, and I'm also a current master's student at the University of Florida. So the goal of our project is to design an open source professional level microprocessor IP. Most open source microprocessor IPs that you find on the internet are hobbyist projects. Uh, very few of them reach uh, the professional level of say a RISC-V or ARM. Now we're not going to try to compete uh, with RISC-V or ARM. Uh, instead we're going to try to target a small but powerful 8 or 16-bit architecture. So what good is this? Well it does fill a, a real niche. Um, if you look at, um, you know, a SOC like the one on the right here, uh, it has two large um, ARM cores as well as a, a, a GPU as well. But then you have all these other sub-blocks here that uh, need some kind of, oftentimes need some kind of a microprocessor for a program, programmable high-level control. You know, it could be just high-level control of uh, some kind of DSP block or uh, design for test uh, to do like self-test on ATE or, or even in the field um, <clears throat> or to manage uh, a command inter interface like SPI, I2C or USB and so you want that core to be uh, powerful but small so small as in a uh, small footprint so that's where we think that uh, you know an 8 or 16 bit architecture would fit this role nicely. So what do we mean by professional level IP? Well, first of all, we need to have something that has third party software support. And in order to, to achieve that, we need to choose an existing ISA that has assemblers, compilers, and an existing code base available. And then uh, we need to use modern RTL design techniques and good practice. So we're going to make sure that we have a fully synchronous design with a single clock. This is going to make our IP uh, easy to integrate for the for the customer uh, have a well-defined separation of control and data path um, this is uh, surprisingly uh, uncommon <laughs> in the uh, hobbyist IP that, that I've looked at um, and have a good uh, separate separation of hierarchy make sure that, uh, that your, your modules are small and easy to maintain and well-defined uh, lastly, uh, we want to make sure that we're looking at how things are synthesizing into standard cell libraries and FPGAs to make sure that uh, you know the the RTL the RTL that we're writing is getting uh, efficiently synthesized into the uh, target process or FPGA. And another important aspect is to have an industry standard SOC bus, and which means a way of connecting every piece of the SOC together. Uh, you can make your own bus, but it's better to choose something that's, that exists, that's well established, and uh, one that's open source. And so to do that, we just decided to choose the Wishbone bus. It's easy to integrate, conforms to a known standard, and it's open source. Yes, and uh, you know, one of the other things that, we, that, that a professional level IP would, would have is uh, we would analyze the trade-offs of power speed and area. Um, you know, I can go and de design the world's most advanced microarchitecture with all the most high performance features, but that's not what we're, what we're after here. We're trying to design a small, powerful, uh, area efficient IP. Um, so again, uh, we, need, we need to be synthesizing into a standard cell library to provide that, pe that, that uh, feedback to our design. Uh, you know, make sure that we're minimizing timing paths for a maximum clock rate and that uh, we're implementing multi-cycle solutions versus pipeline solutions to get that balance of area and power. And the final thing that probably sets us apart from 
maybe a Hobbyist or a, any of the other ones that we've seen is a verification of the IP itself. And uh, to do that, we're doing a full Verilog test bench to verify the, the ISA itself. So one of the big questions to ask is which ISA to pick. And we have to base our decision on the instruction set, not the existing silicon that's out there. And there are lots of options to choose from in designing and developing a new high performance microarchitecture, but we chose the Motorola 6809 because it really stood out. So the Motorola 6809 is part of the uh, 6800 family. Um, so the, the story goes that, you know, back in the earlier mid 70s, Motorola designed the Motorola 6800 and uh, they did a pretty good job, but the the uh, Motorola itself didn't do a very good job of marketing it. And so the engineers that designed the 6800s le uh, left and uh, went to Moss Technology uh, to design the 6502, which <laughs> ended up being an extremely popular CPU. I mean, uh, you can just name, you know, the Apple II, the Commodore 64, uh, uh, all the Atari computers, uh, all the game, you know, pretty much all the game systems, and the Nintendo, the and the and the early Ataris, used the uh, the 6502. So, what happened is Motorola kind of uh, realized that they messed up and they uh, did a complete redesign uh, based on analysis of the 6800 code and came up with the 6809. Uh, there's an interesting article. Um, in uh, Byte magazine at the at, uh, of the other day, uh, which kind of goes through their design philosophy. Uh, the picture on the right there is uh, Terry Ritter and Joel uh, Boney, who uh, I believe Terry wrote the article, but they were the system art architects um, for the 6809. And uh, what they ended up with is, which is in our opinion, the cleanest and most powerful ISA of the 6800 uh, family. With the least bloat. I mean, you could say maybe that the that the uh, HC12 is a little bit more powerful, but the HC12 has some unnecessary features. Uh, you know, I like to say whereas the 6502 was you know very lean and and cost effective, the 6502 is just kind of the next step. It's lean and mean. Um, it's widely considered the best of the classic 8-bit uh, processors. Um, and one of the nice things about the 6809 is that it has 16-bit instructions. So it's an 8-bit processor, but it has 16-bit instructions. So what does that mean to us? Well, we can design a 16-bit microarchitecture to take advantage of this. Um, and uh, the other thing is that being that it's an uh, older design from 1978, we shouldn't have any legal issues uh, you know, using the 6809 uh, ISA, but creating our own microarchitecture. So now you know where we get our name from, you know. Um, so we're based on the 6809 ISA, uh, so, but we're the faster implementation of this ISA, so 68 Turbo 9, or as we like to say, just the Turbo 9. Um, now one of the interesting things to, to think about here is that, you know, Terry Ritter and Joel B Boney, they wrote the, uh, the instruction set architecture spec. Uh, so in fact, that spec that they wrote 40, you know, over 40 years ago is now our spec, but we're creating a new microarchitecture. And if you take that spec and you combine it with the wishbone spec, we pretty much have 90% of, of, of the uh, spec there. And now we just got to fill in the, in the uh, dots and make the most uh, efficient and high performance uh, microarchitecture that we can. Okay. So I don't want to, you know, start showing you 6809 code and looking at the uh, instruction set architecture spec, um, but let's just go over a few key key points here uh, about the ISA. So first off, what's the most important thing to us? Well, I would say that the most important thing for our IP is going to be uh, code size and then uh, performance. Um, implementation uh, area is probably going to be the most uh, important thing as far as uh, area is concerned. I mean, implementation is, is concerned. Um, and then just a couple of key points here. So the 6009, it would be considered CISC. Now it's kind of un unfair to call it CISC because it's, you know, 1978, well before the, the definition was even uh, created. Uh, I would call it a CISC light because it's more of like what's called an accumulator type of architecture than a, you know, a very complicated CISC architecture like a 68,000. 
but this is a good thing because uh, this will give us more compact code because you know more complex instructions do more things therefore we should uh, we should have less instructions to implement the same function on the other hand sysc is actually more difficult to pipeline but we'll figure that out uh, it's got 8 and 16-bit instructions I spoke about this before 16-bit instructions mean less code we can put a 16-bit ALU in there for, for fewer cycles that's 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 a good thing operands um, so it has uh, two operands so one is assumed to be the register or the accumulator uh, and the other would be memory so uh, in a single instruction does a load and the operand uh, it, it loads the operand and does the execution with with one uh, instruction unlike risk which has a load store ar uh, architecture registers uh, you know I'm not going to go through all of them here but it has a small amount of re registers in this case nine uh, whereas, whereas a risk architecture usually has you know upwards of thir 32 re registers which is this is actually a good thing for area uh, and it's also a good thing for interrupts because now when you have an interrupt you can pop and push all all the registers very very quickly and interrupts is going to be an important thing for our design because uh, we're going to be more of kind of like a m microcontroller where we're going to have to respond quickly this could be a bad thing for compilers compilers don't like uh, architectures with a small amount of re registers but you know we have to have a trade-off instruction length we have a variable length in uh, in instructions um, this can produce smaller code uh, you know more it's more compact like the you know arm even tries to you know uh, compress their um, instructions with the arm uh, thumb in instruction set so I'm not going to say it's exactly like that because it's it's a it's a different beast. But uh, the variable length instructions should produce smaller code. Um, on the other hand, variable length instructions are going to make our decode logic a little bit more complex. The memory architecture is von Neumann. Uh, what that means is that the program and the data are shared on the same bus rather than Harvard, uh, where you have you know separate program and data uh, uh, buses. Um, I uh, can't really say anything positive about von Neumann. Uh, well, I guess you could say that it might make your overall uh, SOC smaller. Uh, well, not SOC, but your o overall uh, design smaller because you don't have two uh, two buses, two two memory buses. But um, other than that, the, for from a performance standpoint, you you have half the bandwidth. Addressing modes. Um, this is uh, that's one of the things that the 1609 has that's really nice is it has some really powerful indexed and indirect addressing modes. That the way that they've encoded it is really quite. Uh, they they did a really good job, and so these addressing modes uh, should make for more compact code. Um, and uh, lastly, the interrupt system. Uh, so it has a direct vector in interrupt system. So you get a you get uh, different types of interrupts, and it has a direct vector uh, to uh, go and you know jump to a certain piece of code to uh, handle that interrupt as fast as possible. So before we talk about our microprocessor, we need to talk about its pre predecessor. Twelve years ago, as an undergrad at the University of Florida, my crazy friend Kevin here designed and released the Gator microprocessor. It was based on the HC11 instruction set and used a completely multi-cycled implementation. So there was no pipelining or anything like that on that processor. It was written in VHDL and microcode, and the GUP was a modest two and a half times faster than the original HC11. But we think we can do better. So how will the Turbo 9 improve on the GUP? Well, first of all, it's a complete redesign. Uh, we have 12 years of industry experience each, so we're pushing to make this professional level IP. Um, it's based on the 6809 instruction set, which is more powerful and efficient than the HC11 and has more potential. And in our case, we're doing something that's completely unique by pipelining the 6809 microarchitecture, and we're developing a new custom microcode assembler. So the reason we brought up the GUP is to point out lessons learned. And one of the major bottlenecks in uh, performance is bus cycle timing. And so in his design of the GUP, Kevin registered the inputs and outputs on the data bus to reduce propagation delay. And this combined with the input registers of synchronous memory creates a three cycle delay on reads. So it takes three cycles to read data back with two unused clock cycles 
in one single read, which is very inefficient. And likewise, with, with writes, it takes two clock cycles and one unused clock cycle. So the solution to this problem is uh, to pipeline the bus. And so, we're, so we chose the, the uh, pipeline wishbone bus um, uh, for the turbine. And as you can see, we have essentially the same setup where we have registered uh, outputs and registered inputs and a, and a registered memory uh, to make sure that we you, uh, keep our propagation delay short. Uh, but so we still have that three cycle latency, but now somehow magically we're going to start uh, other read cycles interleaved and essentially pipelining them, right? So some, somehow we're going to have to uh, do something useful on these two cycles uh, in, in between this, the, this uh, read. Um, and uh, we got a little bit of a hint here. We have uh, an execute stage and, and a fetch stage. Uh, but likewise, even on, even on a write, um, you know, you can you can have a, a read cycle and then interleave some some write cycles in, in between as well. Um, so our bus is going to start to start having a lot more intelligence. Okay, so here's a high-level pipeline microarchitecture. Um, not trying trying not to not show too much detail uh, yet to confuse you guys, um, but I want to focus on the uh, wishbone bus. And uh, and kind of show you how we're going to keep that bus uh, busy, you know, with, on every single clock cycle. That's what's important. And so, at the top here, uh, you see, uh, you know, kind of a almost a classic uh, pipelined architecture. Uh, if you're familiar with, you know, MIPS or whatever, we are missing some of the stages of, of MIPS. But uh, you know, we're designing our own microarchitecture here, so it's going to be a little bit different. Um, so we have a fetch, decode, and execute stage. But we also have internally to the Turbo 9. So this area here is, is the actual microprocessor IP. This is outside the processor. So this is a shared program and data bus. But so this is Vivon Newman, like, the, like a regular 6809. But inside the Turbo 9 itself, we're going to have that Harvard architecture. We're going to have that separate program and data bus. And this is how we're going to keep that that uh, that shared data bus busy. Is that whenever there's there is a a read from the uh, execute stage, so say you're 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 reading some operand, um, it will take three cycles of latency. Uh, so that command will come from 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 this data bus. But inside the wishbone controller, there's going to be a bus arbiter. There is a bus arbiter. I already designed it. <laughs> And it's going to, um, when it has free cycles, it's going to take requests from the uh, program bus. And it's going to interleave those in there. So this bus arbiter has some priority scheme in it. So it has to, uh, whenever there is, there's a request from the data bus, it's going to take priority. But whenever it's free, it's going to take a request from the program uh, bus. Um, there's also... The other thing to think about is that this is pipeline, right? So when you put a transaction here, it takes, you know, one, two, three cycles for it to come back. So not only uh, are you going to have to deal with these two buses, but you also have to track your transaction. So when you launch a transaction here, you're going to have to have some kind of uh, tracking. In my case, I use like a FIFO uh, to to track these requests. And then when, as they came back, as you get that NAC back you have to then return that to the correct bus. So, you know, if it came from the data bus, you have to return that data here, or if it came from the, from the program bus, you have to return it over there. So you have to actually know which side it's, it's, uh, uh, it needs to be dispersed to um, and have to keep kind of a, kind of a history. Um, also, uh, just to kind of look at, as it's drawn here, this, is, this is a, has a six cycle latency. Um, so if we just count them real quick, one, two, three, and then if we say we go through the program uh, data bus, uh, four, five, six, and then we're back here. So that's six cycles. Uh, this is an optional pipeline register, so you can actually remove that. In fact, that's how I run it right now. Uh, so it has a latency of five cycles. But this arbiter, this uh, wishbone con controller, if you will, 
uh, has the ability to um, have two extra pipeline stages. Now, why would you do that? Well, uh, to shorten your propagation delay. So there's uh, this is obviously showing very, very simple, but in reality, you're not going to have just, just a synchronous memory. You're going to have devices, all kinds of stuff out here, and you have a bunch of decode logic, and that is actually going to take a large part of your design, and it's going to create very long timing paths. So you can, you can pipeline that. Uh, you can just literally drop registers in, and this wishbone controller is smart enough to figure out um, you know how long um well it it can it can basically track to see when is transactions come back and it just adjusts uh, accordingly they can do that for a, a, an additional two uh registers uh the other thing to point out is that the throughput put is one cycle right so the latency in the, in shown here is six but the throughput if you're if you're doing a good job you should be getting a result every cycle so here's the detailed pipeline uh, microarchitecture. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail here. Uh, just want to point out that we have the the data bus and the and the program bus, uh, as you saw before. We have the external shared bus, and then uh, here we have in the in, in the orange we have uh, what I would consider the data path. And that's you know what would have your 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 operands the the actual data that that you're performing uh, uh, functions on, and in the blue we have the uh, con control. So this is uh, all your control vac vectors, which uh, eventually control your data path to manipulate that data. In the red we have stall lot logic. So this is a pipelined um, implementation. So we're going to have separate stages. And when one stage isn't ready, uh, we need to be able to stall uh, the other appropriate stages so that uh, they can catch up. Okay, so let's take a look at the fetch stage. Uh, the first, first thing to note here is that we have this 8-byte uh, FIFO, which is being used as an instruction queue, uh, which is similar to a cache. I, I hesitate to call it a cache, but it does serve uh, some similar purposes. Uh, its main purpose is a staging area for the instructions. So, um, as we mentioned before, a 6009 can have a instruction anywhere from from one byte long to up to five bytes. Uh, so we need to have a staging area where we can build up this instruction before it moves over into the decode stage. Uh, also, if these stages are busy, we can continue to keep that that bus out here busy. And we can just load up this FIFO with with all kinds of program data um, as well. So in that way, it kind of does does act as as a as a cache, as a kind of looking ahead. And that leads me over to uh, the program counter, right? So there's another program counter here as well as in the in the execute stage. Uh, so this program counter is it makes the assumption that it's just going to keep uh, loading bytes one after the other sequentially. So it's kind of dumb in that regard. Um, but uh, so it's it's going to keep uh, sending sequential addresses down the program buses, and you're and and the and the wishbone controller is going to uh, just keep loading up this FIFO, and that leads me to uh, discussing the uh, pending transaction and flush logic. So what do I mean by that? So you have to keep track of the pending transactions, um, so that if you ever need to flush the FIFO, you know. How many pending transactions you have out on this bus out here, so that when they come back to here, you can flush them, um, because you know this this program counter is going to assume that everything's sequential. But as, as soon as you have a jump or a branch, you're going to have to command this this uh, program counter to jump to a different address, and you're going to have to flush the the uh, remaining transactions. Uh, one last thing to point out is that the FIFO itself is the pipeline register in this case. And so it's designed specifically so that, that the combina uh, combinational lot logic is all on this side of the, of the FIFO and that these registers stay static and that this side there is, is no com combinational uh, logic. So um, that's just to make sure that we have a, a, a well-defined um, timing paths. Okay, so let's take a look at the decode stage. Um, so what does the decode stage do? Well, it translates 6809 instructions into micro ops. And what do I mean by that? Well, 
If you look at uh, a Intel microarchitecture starting somewhere around the 486 or Pentium, uh, they move from a multi-cycle implementation into a pipeline implementation. And what they did was they took their CISC instructions and they would break them up into uh, what they called micro ops, uh, which are really just simple um, risk instructions. Uh, that are then issued to a specific uh, execute unit. Uh, so that's what's happening here. Uh, let's take a look at uh, starting here at the instruction format decode logic. And the first thing that the instruction format decode logic does is that it determines the length of the in instruction. So as soon as a valid byte comes in the FIFO, it can uh, tell how long the entire instruction is. Um, and wait for for the entire instruction to fill up um, into the FIFO before then the the loading the next in, in instruction and, and moving on. Uh, the other thing that it does is um, decode the instruction format, so um, it can determine the uh, the address mode um, and it can decode directly. For example the uh, the index addressing or indirect addressing and uh, that then gets directly uh, decoded and sent to the address ALU in the next stage. It's not even in the microcode. So some of the stuff here is not in the microcode. It's actually decoded directly off the opcode. Uh, which leads me to the other thing that's, that's decoded directly off the opcode is the uh, register pointers. So this is a uh, uh, the re register pointer uh, decode table. And when, so what does that do? Well, you have a lot of uh, instructions that use the same microcode but have different operands. So for example, add A, add B, add D, right? These are, can essentially use the same piece of microcode but use different operands. So what the register pointer decode table does is it points to the necessary operands for that instruction and therefore actually save the microcode. Uh, a, a, a quick uh, note is that the Gator microprocessor used over 256 microcode words, um, whereas we're implementing the entire 6809 instruction set under 64 uh, microcode words uh, by, by using this technique. Uh, the other thing to look at is the, is, is the jump decode table. So what this does is it um, has the, the microcode address uh, for the um, for that particular opcode, so when we get the instruction in, it can actually point to the correct address in the microcode where that um, micro op is for the for that particular operation. Um, uh, lastly, we we have the branch prediction logic. Um, in this case, uh, we have not implemented that yet. Uh, it's something that we're going to look at. We're not going to just do it blindly. We're not going to uh, do just implement it without looking at uh, how much area it's going to take and the performance that we're going to gain. So we're going to always look at that trade-off. Um, other than that, we got the stall logic. I think we look, talked about that. The micro sequencer um, that'll come into play later. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, execute stage. So the first thing to look at in the execute stage is uh, the register file. So it's pretty standard. You have your accumulators, uh, some index registers, stack pointers, uh, direct page register, program counter, and a condition code register. Uh, then we have two ALUs, two 16-bit ALUs in parallel. The original 6800, oh, sorry, 6809 only had an 8-bit ALU. Um, and now we got two 16-bit in parallel. So um, definitely going to have a performance in increase from that. And not only that, um, the uh, we have this de this dedicated address ALU which has uh, some dedicated hardware to handle all that complex uh, index addressing that the uh, 6809 has. So that's going to provide a, a, a really nice speed up. Uh, you, we can calculate uh, the the index address in one microcycle. Uh, we can do an index uh, sorry an indirect address in two microcycles. So that's going to give us a good a good speed up. Uh, the last thing to look at here is the data memory controller. So what does this do? Well, so it actually handles all the interaction uh, between the execute stage and the wishbone con controller. Uh, one of the things that uh, it'll do is, for example, if you're doing a 16-bit transaction, 
uh, it'll split it up into two 8-bit tran transactions to the uh, Wishburn controller. But not only that, it kind of acts like, uh, it doesn't act, it is uh, some extra pipeline stages. They're kind of hidden in, in a way. Um, so say you do a 16-bit write. So you do a 16-bit write to the data memory controller. It accepts that 16-bit write, and then your execute stage can then move to the next instruction. Meanwhile, this is finishing that 16-bit write, and if the next instruction has a request to the data memory controller, it will just stall. So uh, in, in that way, it's able to uh, make the processor run faster because if that next in, in, in instruction didn't have a re request to the data memory con controller, then it wouldn't stall. So it's, it's uh, flexible like that. So um, it can actually uh, uh, speed up the uh, e execution depending on the order in which the in instructions come in. All right, let's look at the execute stage from a multi-cycle standpoint. Um, so, you know, we have these in instructions. Some of them take multiple cycles. Uh, it's a CISC instruction that has to issue multiple uh, sequences of these little RISC instructions. So how is that done? Well, we start to utilize the microsequencer that I glossed over earlier, but so that first microcode comes in, sorry, that first micro op comes in from the uh, jump table, right? So that, that's the address to the first micro op that gets issued into the execute stage. But if you need to then uh, have more micro ops to, to execute that particular instruction, we would then start to use the microsequencer. We would, we would sequence, sequence through it using the microprogram ca counter to issue the follow on uh, microcode addresses to produce those micro ops. Uh, one thing to note here is that um, on the fetch side, uh, a lot of the instructions are multi-byte, right? So it's actually going to take multiple cycles over here to uh, to fetch a complete instruction because some of these instructions can be five bytes. Most of them are like three or f uh, like two or, like two or three bytes, but because this takes multiple cycles to load uh, the next instruction. Uh, the fact that your execute stage is going to take multiple cycles to execute, you're actually doing two things in parallel at the at the same time, and that's a that's a nice uh, 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 balance, if you will. Okay, so I've been doing a lot of talking here, but I want to point something out. So we have these three blocks here that are very specific to the opcode that you are decoding. Uh, they are um, so you have to maintain these three three blocks separately and becomes very very tedious uh, and easy to make mistakes so we need a way to um, to consolidate this and, and organize it well and this is going to introduce our secret weapon so what is our secret weapon it's the custom microcode assembler of course and this uh, tool outputs those three blocks that you saw on the previous slide in Verilog. And uh, it's a macro assembler, so uh, it separates the functionality from the mic microarchitecture details. So that allows us to develop both of these things in parallel. Kevin can work on designing the architecture and, and uh, all the details of the implementation. And the tool doesn't have to really know anything about uh, the architecture. And in our case, uh, we produce a microprogram and 15 decode tables that are used in the design. Um, and it's all from well-organized microcode that gets assembled into this Verilog and giving us the best of both worlds. In addition to all of these, um, these three blocks that we get to output, we also produce statistics which uh, show control vector usage and assist the optimization of the microarchitecture. Um, we also dump internal data structures that are used in the assembler so we can see what's going on there and if there's any problems, we, we understand what, what needs to be changed and what needs to be updated. So here's a microcode example. Everything on the left side of the, the slide is an input to the program and everything on the right is an output from the program. So I'll direct your attention to the data inc and macro. This is, uh, this is defined in the macro file that you can see below which contains a listing of control vectors and their, and their settings away from the defaults. Um, those are processed and then we produce the output microcode system Verilog file that you see on the right. 
and you see that listing with the control vectors and the associated values that are um, equivalent to those EQUs that you see on the left there. Also seen here is the listing. It looks identical to the listing you see from the microassembly file, but in comment form, just above the uh, the entry in the, the output SV file. And uh, this just helps identify where you are in, in the, uh, the microassembly file, makes it a lot easier to read and uh, find problems if there are any problems. Yeah, this is this is kind of like a, uh, a listing file of a, a equivalent if, if you were to use an assembler. A couple other things to point out here is, uh, so in this example, just so you understand the how the microcode works, um, so this is the microcode for a increment instruction and in fact it's the microcode for um, several different versions of the increment instruction so you have ink A, ink B and then uh, increment a memory uh, lo location and with direct addressing, index addressing and extended ad ad addressing. So this section of the microcode here is uh, is actually used to produce those decode tables and these are the uh, opcodes associated with um, uh, that, that that will go into those de decode tables. So this is where, where you decode the opcode directly um, and you can see that uh, we, we have a decode table for uh, this is the uh, jump table A uh, decode table, this is jump table B de de decode table and then you have the RA, which is the RA, uh, is the register pointer for the A side of the ALU. So what we're doing here is we're doing an increment on RA, which would be A for ink A or B for ink B, and we're writing it back to that same register, and we're setting uh, the appropriate bits in the CCR uh, accordingly. And then this would be used for the um, for the uh, memory modify type instructions. Uh, the last thing here is the jump table A next PC. So this is actually a micro operation uh, that would would say, okay, I want you to progress to the to the next uh, program counter. Um, the the next place that the program counter is pointing to, uh, but get your your address from jump table A, and that's would be the next instruction. Um, and then these are the control vectors, like Mike said. Um, just to give you a quick uh, explanation of the, this one, this is a data increment. Uh, so what we're doing is we're doing a data ALU operation A plus B. Uh, we're setting the B side to zero. We're setting the A side to whatever the argument is. Um, and then we are setting the condition select, which is the carry in to one. And that's going to create that, uh, that, that increment function. So here's an example of the decode table that uh, Kevin was just talking about for the branch instruction. And you can see the decode uh, directives on the left there. And uh, for this particular example, we're looking at jump table A. So you can see the red arrows are coming from each of those jump table A uh, directives. And these produce entries in the jump table A uh, table. And what they're returning are addresses to get to those points in execution for for the branch instruction, and as you can see here, um, this also we're also producing the EQU value in comments to the right there. So you see it says branch, and then uh, we're also pulling those comments out from the microassembly file to the right there too. So you can see everything that's associated with this uh, this address and this point in execution. Yeah, this is, this is nice for, so if someone else is coming along and only looking at the Verilog um, and not looking at the microcode, they can actually understand what this Verilog is doing by saying, oh, okay, this is this is uh, this particular opcode and this is the, the address in the microcode that it's going to, and that address is this EEQ. So another thing that this tool produces are statistics. And uh, what we can see here is, um, in this particular case, is a branch address control vector. Um, on the right there, you can see the load direct extended addressing mode and load index. Those have the, the, the largest bar graphs, if you will, um, showing that they're the, they're the most commonly used. 
um, in this particular case. Uh, the statistics really give you a good insight into how these control vectors are being used. And uh, we can use this to optimize the control vector encoding and improve uh, performance and, and area. So you can compress your, your, uh, your microcode down. The microprogram word can be uh, reduced as well if you see something's not being used at all. Um, it, for example, like the uh, indirect where cursor's pointed to right now or any of the other ones that are blank. Okay, so let's start talking about the performance of the Turbo 9 versus the 6809. In order to do this, we need to compare clock for clock. Uh, on the 6809, the instruction cycle time is measured in bus cycles. And uh, the, these bus cycles are fixed. So one bus cycle equals four clocks. And these four clocks are actually used to produce two quadrature clocks, E and Q. Uh, one E or Q is basically one clock, uh, one bus cycle. Um, so the instruction cycle time on the 6009 is fixed and predictable. On the Turbo 9, this is not true. Uh, the instruction cycle time is decoupled from the bus. Uh, and this is because of the instruction queue and the wishbone bus pipeline. And uh, this makes the bus cycles variable. Um, the throughput, though, is one clock cycle. That means that you, we are moving data on every single clock cycle, but that data could be data or it could be program. So uh, it's, it, it depends on, on how long it takes to fill up the instruction queue. Also, the latency is variable. So what's actually happening is that the instruction cycle time of the current instruction is dependent on the if the next instruction is already available in the queue. If so, then the minimum number of, of, of clocks is required for that instruction. If not, then it's dependent on the number of clocks it takes to to fill the queue to the, to uh, get that next instruction in the queue. Um, so how did I measure this? So in order to measure this, uh, I created an assembly program that had uh, each type of instruction uh, repeated eight times and then preceding that that group of eight was a, a custom instruction that would be used just to fill pre-fill the instruction queue and so you can see right here this is the instruction queue level it's getting filled to eight and then we're bursting a number of instructions and you can see here in this particular example the this instruction can run uh, at a minimum of one clock cycle but then as you repeat multiple instructions, you you drop to two clock cycles. So that's how I was able to measure um, the maximum and minimum number of clock cycles for the Turbo 9. Okay, so let's look at our, at the performance now, our performance results. Um, and we're gonna look at the inherent instructions. What do I mean by inherent? Well, that's uh, the type of operations that do not require any uh, memory for the for the operands, so obviously a, a no a no op, an inc a, uh, left shift a or a clear a. These are all operating on the internal registers, um, and they're all one byte long. And um, on the 6009, they took two bus cycles, which is the equivalent of eight clock cycles. And on the Turbo 9, they take one clock cycle consistently, um, giving us a performance factor of eight. Um, this is more significant than is first apparent. And at first you say, well, yeah, a no-op takes one clock cycle. But this shows the throughput. It demonstrates the throughput of the pipeline. Um, the fact that uh, we are loading and executing this instruction in one clock cycle shows that our pipeline is producing a throughput of one clock cycle. So you can laugh at me for being excited that a no-op takes one clock cycle, but I think it's pretty cool. Okay, so let's look at some 8-bit uh, operation instructions. And for this, uh, we're going to use the add a uh, instruction, and we're going to use every single possible addressing mode. Uh, this are, these are all the addressing modes that, that the uh, 6009 can do. Um, and you can see that we actually get start to get uh, really good performance at the more complex addressing modes. That's because of our dedicated hardware that we uh, for index addressing. Um, 
And like I said, we're also getting variations. So this is to do with uh, if the instruction queue is full. Um, so it, it's quite impressive. I mean, even a an immediate instruction, so a two byte immediate instruction, if that if that instruction exists in the instruction queue, you can burst that in one clock cycle. Um, so it, you know, whereas the sixty or nine is always a fixed, you know, eight clock cycles. Um, so, I mean, you know, we're getting some pretty good good numbers here. I mean, eight x performance, an average of five point three, a very nice increase. Okay, let's look at some sixteen bit instructions. Um, so we're using the subtract d here. Uh, and again, you, we're starting to see a similar pattern. Uh, we're bursting at one, one clock cycle. We're getting um, upwards of, of 8x uh, performance increase over a 6, 8, or 9. Um, we're also seeing a, a little bit better performance at 5.8. Okay, now we're going to look at some 8-bit store instructions. Um, again, same type of pattern. In fact, we're getting excellent performance with the store instructions. This is because of the uh, the nature of the data memory uh, controller, remember I said that it actually adds it works as a, um, a extra pipeline stages. So because in a store in a write when you're writing out, you don't have to wait for the data to come back. You just basically command the data memory controller to to do that write, and then the the rest of the pipeline just moves on. Uh, so that's why we're seeing this this very high uh, performance factor. Is uh, it's basically taking advantage of that parallelism and just moving on independently uh, to do that memory operation while the rest of the pipeline continues. Um, yeah, everything else, you know, I mean, I mean, we're getting performance numbers upwards of, you know, almost 11x uh, for some of the, these these uh, these particular dressing modes. So very impressive. Okay, so let's take a look at the 16-bit store instructions, and we're starting to see something interesting. Uh, you would expect the 16-bit store instructions to have a higher performance than the 8-bit store instructions, but they actually have a slightly lower performance of 6.5 versus the 7.1. And my theory on this is uh, the data memory controller, uh, because now you're 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 telling the data memory controller to do uh, a 16-bit write it is um, you're queuing up all these these uh, stores, and uh, the data memory controller is actually uh, starving the instruction queue. Remember, I said that the uh, wishbone controller has an arbiter that gives the priority to the data memory controller all the time. Well, um, I think and 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 looking in simulation, the instruction queue basically goes all the way down to zero. Um, I, so I th and you can see that the max clock cycles are going up versus the uh, the the 8-bit stores, and so my theory here is that if I was to put a limit, um, set a limit on the instruction queue such that if it was uh, if the instruction queue was at one or zero, to uh, actually give the priority to the instruction queue uh, to to the fetch stage rather than the data memory controller. That we would get a, little, uh, a better uh, balance, and this and this number would increase. That's my theory. I'll have to test it in simulation, uh, but uh, that's why we we uh, do this. Okay, so here's an example of a memory modify instruction. So, what is a memory modify instruction? Well, a memory modify instruction uh, is an instruction that loads uh, its operand from memory. Does does some kind of uh, operation on it and then writes it back. So it's a read, uh, uh, execute, and a write all in one instruction. So for this, we're using a logical shift left, um, and uh, and so we're getting very good performance. Again, six six point six per, uh, performance in increase. Um, got some good numbers. Ten x performance factor. So this is, these are good results. Okay, jump instructions. Uh, this one was uh, a little harder to uh, to benchmark since you couldn't just throw a bunch of jumps back to back because you would jump all over the place. But anyway, we were able to 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 uh, to do some some benchmarking here, um, 
and uh, the performance is uh, not as good as uh, I would like um, and this is because of the lack of branch prediction well <laughs> this is a jump I should always uh, detect uh, that the that the jump is is, is occurring but uh, the logic is just not there right now so whenever the, these these jumps are occurring you can see that the uh, clock cycle is uh, is always the same and that's because it's flushing every time so uh, still have a performance increase of 3.1 but uh, I think you know we can we can definitely improve uh, this number with some branch prediction okay so let's look at uh, branch instructions so obviously we have a conditional branch not taken and taken so we have to test both uh, situations um, and then we also have long branch uh, instructions so these are uh, branches that can can span the entire uh, address space and these are branches that can only uh, extend plus or minus uh, um, the, within the 8-bit eight, eight, eight range um, of relative addresses. So again, we don't have any um, branch prediction, um, but uh, perform, average performance is 4.4, but I mean, this is a pretty bad number here. I mean, we're still faster than the 68809. That's, uh, you know, it's 1.8 uh, times faster, but again, we you know we got we 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 have to look into branch prediction and uh, how to effectively and efficiently uh, implement that okay so here's some performance testing we did uh, where we wrote some uh, more real world uh, type assembly for 6809 and uh, in this example we have a variety of addressing modes some 8-bit some 16-bit operations and uh, as a result we see a 5.2 time uh, faster clock-for-clock clock performance than a traditional 6809. Okay, so let's talk about some implementation results. Um, so we've been using the Xilinx uh, uh, Artex 7 FPGA uh, to uh, synthesize for, and uh, the Artex uh, 7 is uh, based on 28 nanometer TSMC process, and we're meeting time at 100 megahertz. Uh, one thing to note is that the analysis of the timing pass has proven to be a little bit difficult due to the coarse mapping of the RTL onto these logic cells. Um, in the past, I, I seem to have not had as much of, of an issue with this, uh, but it seems like it's hard to identify um, some of the what is the actual ca causing some of the uh, timing issues because they are mapping you know a lot of the fu functions onto one logic cell and you can't really see um, what logic is uh, you know the the uh, culprit uh, the solution really is just to get a standard cell library synthesis uh, flow going um, I need to get my hands on on, on any kind of uh, standard cell library would be fine. 45 nanometer, 90 na nanometer doesn't matter as long as I can have that uh, more discrete um, uh, view that where I can look at a, at a timing report and see uh, the individual gates and and, and map that, that are mapped closer to um, the nets in the RTL. Um, also, this would allow me to do better uh, power estimation and area estimation with the resulting net list. So uh, this is definitely something that we want to uh, move to in the, in the future. So with that, what is our current status and where do our next steps take us? Uh, Curtis, current status is alpha, um, but we're incredibly close to a beta status at this point. We have uh, microarchitecture functionally complete, micro Assembler is functionally complete, and 95% of the ISA is implemented. We're ready to set up a GitHub preview and make that available, but we're open to license suggestions at the moment. We want to be able to make this available to corporations, to individuals, to pretty much everyone who wants to use it. But um, we also just want to make sure that we retain a license that, uh, that is good for everybody involved. Um, our next goal is beta status, of course, and that's where we have 100% of our ISA completed, but not yet fully verified, um, and that we'd have to implement the remaining stack opcodes and interrupt hardware. And the final goal is release status. Uh, we need to analyze and optimize for speed, power, and area. Um, we'll use standard cell library for uh, 
the for synthesis in the dry stone benchmark or some other benchmarks. Uh, if possible improvements would be branch prediction, style logic, microcode statistics, and uh, anything else. And of course, we'd like to do verification of the entire uh, the entirety of the ISA by creating self-checking model of the ISA with directed and randomized sequences. Lastly, we want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Schwartz and uh, the late Dr. Lynch. Dr. Schwartz is our advisor and mentor for this project. And Dr. Lynch was my teacher um, in undergrad for digital design and computer architecture classes and uh, inspired me to think about designing microprocessors and the different trade-offs and, and how to improve performance and whatnot. Turbo 9, a modern implementation of a classic instruction set. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you over on GitHub and uh, maybe making use of this in your project. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye.